are today. We begin worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintops in our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illuminate the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Oh. 
lesson talks about the transfiguration of Christ. Transfiguration is a really big word and it means to transform or to change. Here's what happened in the gospel lesson. It says, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And the verse goes on, but that's the transfiguration, how his clothing was transformed. His robes were a bright, bright white, like no white on earth. No one had ever seen a white as bright as that. So can you look around your house? Tell me in the comments, can you find something white around your house that you could tell me that you have? Something white and similar to Jesus's robes. I have something white to share. Let me show you. I have two jars here and one has baking powder and one has baking soda. But the problem is I forgot to label them. I wanted to make banana bread later with the boys, but I know if I use the wrong ingredient, my banana bread won't be nice and fluffy. It will be banana bricks instead of banana bread. What do you think? Should I just take the chance? Or should I do a little experiment to see if I can figure out which white powder is the correct one to use? I have some vinegar and I know that baking soda has a huge reaction when you add vinegar to it. How about we use that vinegar and try to find out which one is which? Let's see. Looks like there's a little reaction there. Interesting. Okay, let's see what happens with the other jar. Whoa, that's a huge reaction. Look at that. I think we just figured out which one is the baking soda. It's the one on the right. That's the one I need to bake later. Something remarkable happened when that vinegar hit the baking soda. It was transformed into something different, just like Jesus' robes were transformed when he was transfigured on the mountaintop. In the story, Jesus took a few of his disciples up onto a mountain. Now, these disciples had been hanging around Jesus for a little while. And I would think after seeing him teach and perform miracles, they probably had a pretty good idea of who Jesus was but maybe they still had some doubts or uncertainty. They may have been hoping for some proof to be sure they were following the right person. In those days, there were often people who pretended to be prophets or to be sent from God, but they weren't. So on that mountain, the disciples got some amazing proof. Right before their eyes, Jesus changed. His clothes became super bright white and Elijah and Moses showed up. The cloud came over them and God's voice announced, this is my beloved son, listen to him. If Peter, James, and John didn't know for sure before, they certainly did then. They knew that Jesus was God's son and that God commanded that they listen to him. That must have been an amazing experience. Well, what about us? From reading the Bible, we know who Jesus is and that he went to the cross and died and rose again for us. 
At the same time though, sometimes we want proof. Sometimes we wish that we had facts and evidence to support our faith. We don't have the experience of hearing God's voice speak out loud or seeing Jesus in the clouds. We have some great evidence all around us in the world. We see the work of God's hands through our church and our congregation. We just wanna make sure that our hope is in the right person just as I wanna make sure the right ingredient went into my banana bread. In the Bible, Jesus said that we are blessed when we believe in him without seeing him with our eyes. Is it okay to doubt sometimes? Sure, everyone does at some point, but ultimately we return back to the truth that we find in scripture, that Jesus is God's son, and we listen to him when we read his word, when we pray, and when we come to church. We give thanks for him and his life and for his body of believers, our church. All right, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to trust in that and to keep our faith in you, even when we can't feel or see you. Thank you for taking care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Holy Gospel for this Transfiguration Sunday comes from the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning at the second verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You remember the Wizard of Oz? When you watched the Wizard of Oz the first time, how did you feel seeing behind the curtain? Now maybe you've also seen the prequel, Oz the Great and Powerful, how did you feel seeing that, realizing there actually was a good reason for that curtain, for that deception? The problem, of course, is once you've seen behind the curtain, you can't unsee, you can't unknow that. And so it changes forever your perception. How about this? Do you like magicians? I, I really enjoy watching, I, I watch that movement and that flow, that grace they have that chases your eye. How do you feel when the magic is explained away? There is a joy somehow, there's something to revel in, in the suspension of belief. We all know there's a trick behind what's going on, some sleight of hand, maybe a trap door, but in the illusion, we're allowed to just play and dream. Once we've seen the truth, once, once that illusion has been explained, all power from that suspension of belief is gone. Maybe you know the story 
of Galileo's experiment of dropping two spheres of different weights from a good height. He was arguing against Aristotle that they would fall at the same speed. Now there are perspectives on whether this was a thought experiment or an actual experiment, but in the midst of this, a legend developed that as Galileo performed the experiment, those who were gathered to watch, because they had so been tuned to believe what Aristotle taught, that objects of different weight fall at different speed, that they refused to believe what they saw, that they dropped at the same rate. They had for so long been sure that the gravitational pull on objects was different based on weight, and so they justified away what they were seeing and said it didn't happen. This is maybe a good way to talk about it, confirmation bias. Their need to maintain what they already believed in, regardless of what they had just seen, that bias wouldn't let them see this moment for what it really was. What we see, what we want to see, don't always mesh. What we believe and what we want to believe are similarly challenging. This is because it's, it's so much easier than rethinking, reimagining, re-evaluating what we think or believe or see, and so we just stay in our lane. That changing direction, what Scripture calls repentance, is a challenge. Okay? Repentance literally means to turn around in mind, body, or spirit. And it's hard work. Once we begin that process, it makes us rebuild not just that moment in our life, but every single aspect of our life that depended on that being the truth. This is why some people worry when they get too deep into the Bible, or when they go into seminary, or when they begin to change beliefs about where they are, depending on where those beliefs begin, because what if my entire faith begins to topple. The closer this repentance comes to the core of who we are and what we believe, the harder this is to do, to repent, because so much of who we are is built on these understandings or misunderstandings. Now maybe this is a little bit of a strange way to begin a sermon, but as I look at the text Today, from Mark, there is so much going on that I have to wonder a little bit about Peter and James and John. In the chapter just before this, in chapter 8 in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus asks the disciples who people say that he is. Some say Moses, some say Elijah, some say a prophet, some say John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And in that moment, Peter has his clarity. Peter, Peter declares Jesus, you are the Messiah. And Jesus follows this almost immediately with, okay, this is what that means. We are not going to walk this path blindly. I want you to know, and this is the first time Jesus says this, that I will suffer, I will die, and I will be raised after three days. And Peter, who just three verses ago said, you are the Messiah, now begins to rebuke Jesus. He does not want to believe what this one is telling him. This isn't how this is supposed to happen. Peter is now in trouble. Jesus looks at Peter and rebukes him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Just a couple of verses after that, this text, today's text, happened. 
Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. They go up the mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before them. Jesus is revealed again to be God's Son, using almost identical words from his baptism. The Beloved is here. Listen to him. God says, this is my Son. Listen to him. After having just been face to face with Moses and Elijah, those are large words. It's a comment that the prophets and the patriarchs come after Jesus, not before, and what he says they need to listen to. But they don't, they don't really get it. And it even says that right in the text, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to say, even after seeing and hearing everything that they encountered on top of the mountain, they just could not take it in. They would still, on the road, argue about who is the greatest. They will abandon Jesus in the garden. They will deny him during the trial. They simply do not want to believe that what he said was true. I have always wanted to believe that if I saw Jesus, that if I were in the place of the disciples, I would truly understand the ways of God. I would never delude myself again. Just follow. But this story puts that kind of thinking to the test. Because if those who walked with Jesus, talked with him, and witnessed miracle after miracle, healing after healing could still wonder, then what about me? This text is a peek behind the curtain. It's a glimpse of the truth of what Jesus is doing, but rather than like the Wizard of Oz or like magic, rather than diminishing the hope and the ideal, this revelation opens it up. It elevates it. Rather than lowering the stakes, it raises them, and after this, they have little reason to not to believe or not follow, other than the fact that their human understanding, their need for things to fit into their world, won't allow them to. If I am going to follow you, if you were to truly see Jesus, do you think you would change? Do you think you could repent? Do you think you would follow? Would that give you enough strength to take up your cross and go? Really, would it change anything? I'm not sure what it did to Peter, James, and John. It seems as the narrative goes on, Right? The only thing that finally changes them is death and resurrection. Not just Jesus, but their own in the understanding of what is going on. So let me reword that question just slightly. Do you want to see Jesus as Jesus truly is? Or do you want to see Jesus as your comfort interprets him for you? Throughout this section of Mark, Jesus is saying, this is who I am. And Peter and the others keep wanting to look the other way, interpret in the comfort of a Messiah who has come to conquer and win and kick out those Romans. And Jesus again says, no, this is who I am. the feeder of the 5,000, the healer of those possessed, the healer of those wounded, the, the feeder of the hungry, the lover of the sinner. This, this is who I am. So maybe, maybe taking up our cross is nothing more than laying down our preconceptions about how God is with us. God in Jesus goes where others don't want to go. God in Jesus does what others don't want to do. God in Jesus serves those 
others don't want to. To get there from here, we need to see Jesus for who Jesus really is. We need to see past our illusion, past our structure, past our belief, past our fear, all the way to the cross and the freedom of what it means that Jesus is with you, that Jesus has saved you, and that Jesus will never abandon you. The freedom that this brings means two things. Well, it means a whole lot of things. I'm going to name two. One, I get to follow Jesus. And I do it by understanding what he does, what he says in Matthew 25. As surely as you do it to the least of these who are members of my family, you do it to me. That when we see those we'd like to dismiss, we are called to see Jesus that there is not one person on the face of the earth that when you look into their eyes, you don't see somebody that God loves. It sets you free from the need to control or judge or limit. It just sets you free to love and to serve them even if you can't possibly understand it. And the second today, the second thing that this means is you don't need to fear. You don't need to fear for your salvation when you get it wrong. The disciples, especially Peter, seem to get it wrong again and again and again and again. But all of their hard work to make things happen the way they would like things to happen all of their refusal to follow and see can never undo the power of the cross and the resurrection, a gift for the very wounded and sinful that God loves so fully, a gift of grace, freedom, peace, hope, joy, love, and life itself found through the path of the cross. Yes, Jesus is calling us to more than we can see. But Jesus is also on that path, constantly revealing himself in places where and with people whom we struggle. But it is the face of God nonetheless. And somehow in that relationship, in that connection, in that repentance that we make, that's where faith is found. To look and to say, there you are. I knew you were here, but I couldn't see you. Jesus is revealed to you now and this week. I pray your eyes are open as we begin the season of Lent. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take some time to share the peace of Christ with those around you on Facebook, other social media platforms, and maybe call somebody today and tell them that you're thinking of them and offer them the peace of Christ. Some announcements for folks at Mount Sai. Uh, starting this coming Wednesday on February 17th, we are going to begin a series of online live worship services at six o'clock throughout Lent. Our first one upcoming will be a service for Ash Wednesday. And then in the weeks following that, we will have a midweek Lenten prayer service. You are invited to attend that on Facebook Live or through our YouTube channel. And there's information coming out about that in the weekly news. So you can have all the links that you will need to make that happen. If you have any questions on how to access these services, please reach out to the office, uh, reach out to me by email or give me a call. Be happy to do my best to navigate you to the right place. Following these worship services from 6.30 to 7.30, there will be opportunities for you to come uh, to the church and there will be outdoor prayer stations that are being led by our children, youth, and family and parish education teams. And specifically on Ash Wednesday, you are welcome to come and receive the imposition of ashes uh, during that prayer station time. You are also receiving Lenten care kits to your home. If you are uh, have received those in the past, you'll be receiving another care kit, and that will include ashes along with a bunch of other pieces for Lent. If you don't feel comfortable coming to the church on Ash Wednesday outside for that opportunity, you are welcome to do that at home. There are instructions in there on how to do that or how to do that as we participate online on Ash Wednesday. And that's a lot of information. And we will again get that out to you in an email form. God bless. Peace be with you. Good morning. A few announcements for the Sammamish Hills Community of Faith as we begin this week of ministry and mission together. This week we begin Lent, and so on Wednesday we gather for worship in our digital form for Ash Wednesday. Um, I encourage you to pay attention to the emails, to watch Facebook for all of the pieces that we invite you to be a part of. Um, in preparation for that, this Wednesday, uh, we encourage you to have these things available. A candle, uh, some dirt or sand, a bowl of water and bread and wine or grape juice as we share in a time of Holy Communion as we begin our Lenten journey. As has become tradition the day before Ash Wednesday on Fat Tuesday, um, Anna will be gathering with our youth group at three o'clock here at the church to burn the ashes or burn the palms for the ashes on Ash Wednesday. Uh, it is a good tradition, it is a good thing to remember, and so if there is a young person in your family or that you know who would like to be a part of that, just please be in contact with Anna. There are many emails coming out from her these days as we move into phase two, so please uh, take note of those. Look, uh, look and see what is coming. I think that will be all on that. 
And now we get ready for uh, stewardship, for our offering, for the receipt of the gifts of God, for the work of God in the church. Uh, it's easy in the midst of this time of COVID, this pandemic time, to get the idea that the church is quieter than it normally is. And the doors of the church, yes, are quieter, but the church work, the thing we do as a community of faith continues. Um, our reaching out, our support, our care, our ministry, and we still do that in ways that are new to us. And so um, the only thing that makes that possible is your faithful financial commitment to your congregation. And so I encourage you, take a minute um, and think about your stewardship for this week, for this month, for this year. Uh, you can make a commitment by putting in an envelope and mailing it to the church. You can go to the Mount Si or Sammamish Hills websites and give financially through those. But again, the only reason we can do the work of God in these places is because you make a commitment and follow it through. Let us worship God with our offering.
Prayers of the People Let us pray, guided by Christ, made known to the nations. Let us offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all people in need. For the Gospel proclaimed in word and deed, the communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the faiths of Christ throughout the world. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming into the ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of governments, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer this day, that Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in our hearts who need your loving care, you are invited to share names in the comment section. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beginning.
sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God name above all names worthy of all praise my heart will sing how great is our God how great is our God sing with me how How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God.